Hello and welcome to another episode of Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear. I'm Mitch Ratcliffe and uh, once again we're back with another innovator interview. We recently learned about uh, a new housing concept called an agrihood and the first one of these in the United States is at Olivet Riverside Community and Farm which is about uh, seven miles outside Asheville, North Carolina. It's a 346-acre housing and farm development that combines sustainable living with local food production and community engagement. And it was recently uh, uh, awarded the Best in American Living Award for Best Green Community by the National Association of Home Builders. And we're pleased to have Scott Austin, who's one of the co-founders and the developer of the property, join us on the show. How are you today, Scott? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me. Well, hey, first, can you summarize... What is an agrihood? What's it, what does that mean when you, you use that term? Sure. Our definition of an agrihood is a community that is master planned around agricultural. Now, whether that is a production farm for us um, for mm-hmm. vegetables, as well as edible landscaping throughout with careful consideration done with house placement, allowing for wildlife corridors, um, backdoor trails throughout, limiting the need for vehicles on site and being very careful with our plan on what we forest, what we don't deforest, and how we eliminate trees on site as careful as we can through master planning as well as specific house seating and careful architectural review, um, not leaning towards cookie cutter type of review, but more or less making sure that folks are paying attention to where the house goes, not necessarily what that house looks like. So we're taking a little bit of a different approach um, and it's a holistic look at the earth and, and the land that we've been given and making sure that we are highlighting the, the best parts of it without decimating it. And we are being good stewards to the next generation and creating multi-generational living around more or less a farm. Mm-hmm. Um, it harkens back to the way our grandparents grew up and their grandparents before them. And we have lost that sense of intergenerational living where grandma and grandpa either live with you or near you and you take walks with them and they share their life experiences with you and you grow your own food and you have localized food sourcing and you're providing vegetables and community and support and just encouragement to those folks around you. And we have never, has there ever been, a more evident time of disconnection amongst individuals from their neighbors. And the old adage of do fences make good neighbors, I would say not in the slightest. Um, And we need to find out better ways to find privacy rather than fences and better ways to buy food and share experiences and learn to reconnect with not just our neighbors, but also our, our, grandparents and our children and find better ways to talk about what we're doing as we move forward. So, so that's our version of an aggregate. So, so a couple of interesting things. So you have a, a, a shared bike program, uh, another way of reducing the, the load on the environment uh, to help people get around roughly sure. how many people live in the community or could live in the community, I guess is the best way to put it. Well, we're master plan for uh, 300 and roughly 378 dwellings and that's a mixture of school and um, townhomes and single family dwellings. When we first purchased the property, um, the idea was to keep everything on septic. The problem with septic is multiple fold um, is you have to more or less come in and clear cut an area in your backyard in order to get a septic area down. Mm -hmm. And now you've cut the trees down. You have less erosion control measures in place. You have more runoff. You're and particularly where we are. We are located with a little over a mile and a half of frontage on the French Broad River in Asheville, North Carolina. And we are bordered on one side by Lee Creek and the far side by Newfound. So we literally are on three sides with water. We are virtually a peninsula. And the idea of clear cutting and giving people septic and then you have septic fails, you have runoff. Mm-hmm. So th- really the first thing we did was said, Hey, the smart thing to do here would to be able to bring a, a municipality sewer here so we could eliminate the need to do that. And um, so that's where, that's where we really are. 
and I kind of lost track of your question to be perfectly honest with oh, you yeah. and I got off on a tirade. Yeah. So, so but you're offering shared bike services. Uh, you've got some lending libraries. You have a plan to build a school, which is designed to teach around integration with nature. Uh, so you, you're thinking holistically about creating an environment that is light on the land. The, so, the, the other element of this is the relationship with the farm itself. I, you use the phrase on your side of gardens over golf courses, which is, I, I love that idea because there are too many golf course homes in the world. Um, but does that mean that you've sort of combined the notion of a com- community supported agriculture program or CSA uh, with a housing development? Yes. So right now um, we have, enough production. So for those that don't know, CSA is community supported agriculture, which is a way to front load the farm from operational um, costs. Mm -hmm. Um, Your seeds, your farm management, your labor, the majority of your costs for a farm go into the front end of that. Um, For us, it's deer fencing. It's making sure that we are practicing organic uh, methods throughout every step of our farm from the planting to cultivation to harvesting to literally getting it in folks' hands. And for us to use the farm as the, as the water cooler of the community, if you will, of mm-hmm. that, that hub, that center, this is where people go to share stories. It's where they go to pick up their food and share recipes. It's where they meet their neighbors and they meet the kids of their neighbors. Uh, and it's our job to allow that center of our community to allow folks to engage with one another. It is an icebreaker and a, and a, and a giver to the community. And it's what we need to do is make sure we've got the right production and the right amounts that can support the community as we grow because of a CSA for a farm, our size, we, you asked the question, how many do we have now? We have, I think we have 29 full-time houses today Mm -hmm. with, an average of 2.5 people living in those houses right now. And you've got another 26 homes that will be finished over the next four months and occupied. We've sold 69 as of today. And we are picking it apart in what we consider to be a Hamlet style development, which again goes back to how they lived in Europe, how, how, you would develop along a countryside and you wouldn't necessarily pick a spot and grow out and out and out and out. You, it's more like a, a stem of a rose where you've got a spine and then you're, you have a pedal to the right and a pedal to the left and a pedal to the left and a pedal to the right. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned light on the land. You have a centralized community that is supported by agriculture and you then have pockets of communities along your development that allow them to offer their own. So their gardens might be specialized, for instance, they might work a share garden. Yes. Yeah, so we actually have small shared gardens throughout the community as well. So one of the things we did right out of the bat was realize that an HOA supported farm is very difficult to maintain, especially right out of the gate because farming is difficult. It's challenging. It is dynamic and there, it is not a massively profitable deal. So if we were going to have a community that was literally surrounding a garden uh, of uh, our, our cultivation and our crops, they needed to be managed by a professional company. So we decided that all of that farm would be run by our development team out of the gate. We would have a full-time farmer, full-time farming assistant, and we would have to to deal with those either operational gains or losses for the first three to five years. As part of the development cost, we were well aware of that. The first thing we did out here was plant blueberries and native landscaping. So we have a, farm that is at the central core of Olivet, but then we've also got a large shared community garden uh, on one side of the property by Lee Creek. Um, It's got 26 plots in it right now, and the intention is by spring we're going to quadruple the size of that, where people have um, raised beds, gardens, waters provided, there's an irrigation system to it, it's fenced. That is that area's gathering place. Mm -hmm. Um, There's opportunities for volunteering on the farm and community farm projects at the center, but then there's also opportunities for their own farming to to handle what they want to do on their own. 
farming is very farming seems very wonderful to everybody until you really the rubber meets the road and you got to get out there and weed and till and maintain and so we so not we everybody were, has to work the farm. They they but they participate in the support and consumption of the of the, the the food being grown there. That is exactly right. And the production is handled by a subscription service to a CSA that gives you roughly twenty five weeks of vegetables. You come by, you pick them up. There's recipes in the bags. There's a shared recipe page for the community. They get they get that week's vegetables, and then they also have the opportunity to have edible landscaping throughout the community and blueberries and service berries and pears and apples. We have orchards scattered through the community as well. And we've got edibles along our trail system. So if you're, if you're giving people ways and interactions with food that maybe they've had before, maybe they haven't, but the more we can introduce them, the more we can get people more comfortable with the idea of gardening and farming. And it's less and less foreign than it was 10 years ago. That's and, such a strange idea that we would have to get used to gardening again. Uh, we were so focused on agriculture only 150 years ago. How quickly we change. Isn't that the truth? Yeah. And people are, we are finding it a very easy sell, if you will. Mm-hmm. But that's people, people want to, they would like the idea of front porch, front porch, hearing that front porch close and slam. And knowing that you can go out and play in the creeks until dark and come back skinned up and bruised when, when it's dark and supper time is when they ring the bell. And there's, there is this quality that is built into each of our DNAs that I feel yearns for that. And that connection, not just with the nature, but what that connection does with our friends and our family around that. And we are seeing that day in and day out. And our job is to give people things to do while they live here. And we often say that it's very easy to build a neighborhood, but it is extremely difficult to build a community. So so who lives in the community? Where do these folks come from? And, And do they tend to be economically and culturally diverse or are they more homogenous? Um, I think, We are getting a a large, diverse group from geographically. We see Mm -hmm. more. Um, And our initial wave of folks tend to have similar thinking because um, they're drawn to this. And those are the guys that you expect to be here, guys and, and females. The ones that we're seeing as we are slowly creating this product, this new thing in our, in our environment where folks are going, all right, this is now a new option. Maybe. And and I think that's the, that's the people that we need to attract more than ever are the people that not wouldn't necessarily have thought of this 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. The guys that think that this is a wonderful idea, they've been waiting for it. And this is where they've lived or they shared these experiences with their grandparents or they used to have a garden or they grew gardens or they've been waiting for this their whole life. Those are wonderful folks, and we're getting a lot of those, and those are the ones you would expect. But the most rewarding folks, if you will, are the ones that you you almost have to get them to come along with the idea. And it isn't left. It isn't right. It isn't center. We're finding folks all across political and socioeconomic categories that are coming along and saying, we'd like to share in this experience. But I will say that you know, you've got your, you got your layup. You got the guys that you definitely think are going to be here, and, mm-hmm. but it's it, the most rewarding are the folks that say that that seems like something I would like to learn. I would like to let my children experience that because I really didn't, I'm a generation removed from it and we're lacking in that connectivity. So from a, we are seeing a cross section of, of, of folks, both socioeconomic and political, um, as we reach through here, um, financial, and our job is to continue to increase that spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so that we are getting folks from every walk of life talking to one another about their life and experiencing shared experience that that's, that's the way that we're going to get this planet talking to one another is the next generation and making it normal. 
So one of the things we're seeing, you know, in the wake of the pandemic is that a lot of city dwellers are looking to move out into the the edges of, of the city space. And is that something that you see continuing in, in our agrihoods? Do you think one of the potential destinations that can sort of rearrange the way that we lie on the land, uh, you know, in the sense that if we could put together these communities that are self-sustaining largely in terms of their food production, uh, they're, they're healthy mentally and environmentally, is this, is this the trend of the future in terms of how people choose to live? Yes and no would be my answer. Okay. Look, if we can't if we can't prove that this is a successful and financially rewarding business model, mm-hmm. then it just doesn't work. And if we can't get folks, it's just like solar energy or electric vehicles. If we can't get the large corporations to realize that it is more profitable to do solar or renewable energy, or clean energy, or coming up with a different way to do business, then it is extremely difficult to change people's ideas and conceptions. But when we can go out there as Olivet, um, you mentioned early in the segment that we were one of the first people in the United States doing this. And I would, as much as I would love to take that credit, there, there are quite a few throughout the United States that are doing a very good job of this. And I would, I would, suggest everybody research them. Grow Bainbridge out west, Serenby in Georgia. Um, yeah, we've, and, we've talked uh, to Serenby before on the show, in fact. Yeah, and they, these folks, if we can prove to the world that a electric vehicle is cheaper to manufacture, it is longer, long-term cheaper to own, it's better in the environment, and there's profitability for these folks to do it, we are the electric vehicle of the real estate industry right now. We have to prove to folks that this model works. So you can get these large corporations that have been in the business of taking down big tracks, clear cutting them, doing their business and moving on, that there's a better and there's a better way to do it. And by the way, that better way is profitable. You well, can do, you, you make can a do really both. important point. The, the notion that they do it and move on, it's kind of, you know, set and forget. Uh, what you're talking about is staying engaged in nature, in community, uh, and that that longer term engagement is also a profitable thing to do, both financially and socially. Uh, it, it, would that be a good way to characterize? One hundred percent. You know, we have we have gotten very limited pushback for things that we are trying to accomplish out here, and for something our size with our proximity to water, it's because we're. Uh, originally we got the folks that are our neighbors and our, that were forward thinkers and market makers within the community and mayors and city councilmen and the neighborhoods that surround us. This was not, this was not hidden. This was not forced down anybody's throat. This was not a backdoor deal. This was, we've got an idea for something that we think will be good in the world and that we'd like to pursue it. And this is our idea. And we had a charrette, just a glorified way of a big two day brainstorming session on what we intend to do and offering folks some bit of, somewhat of a crayon in that process that didn't have any vested uh, risk in the project, but certainly were folks in the community that were going to be affected by what we did. Now, so, whether that so like, really like what kind of role participants in the community you're talking about, are you, uh, your direct neighbors, did they get a, a say over some of the, how the interface between all of it and their community is? Yeah, to a certain extent. Um, and I think certain folks would argue they didn't get enough and certain would say that they got more than they ever expected. Right. Um, but our job, when you put together a round table of folks, and I want to say this was October 14th, was when we bought this in 2014. Then by, I think, January, we were holding the shred. And the idea was to bring, we had everybody from the folks that are in charge of keeping the French Broad River clean were involved to the council members within the town of Woodfin, where our property is, to certain neighborhoods that are surrounding us, artist folks in Asheville, what we could do to potentially bring an artist piece to this. Um, so it, 
we try to offer folks somewhat of a of a of input and where we could incorporate those things. It only made sense because these are the guys that are going to be helping us along the way that we're going to be bringing the artist community and whether we bring a small restaurant and more of a sitter center city area that's got more more heat, you know, more more folks right there. We want to make sure that when we go to this, that our master plan was something for everybody and that you don't have this sense of these guys came in here and they're doing this and we didn't know anything about it. And so I would be the first to to say that sometimes you have to do what's best for everybody versus individual. But those were the decisions we had to make. Mm -hmm. But I think if you were to look at how we went about developing all of that, it was strategic and it was with community and, and, and and the leaders of the area um, trying to give them a say in what we were doing. So we weren't fighting an uphill battle firstly, but also it just makes for a better project. Um, some certain times there's a bit of, you know, you're very myopic when you get into an idea and you've got an idea what you want to do. When somebody comes and offers you different ideas, if you're smart, you'll listen to them. And so I understand I that you have a, a geothermal energy source too. And, and is that one of the keys to, the, the community sustainability. And, and if that's the case, it, should other communities thinking about applying your model also be looking at integrating solar or wind if they don't have a geothermal source? Absolutely. And from a geothermal perspective, um, the way that houses are built at Olivet and there was LEED and Green and Energy Star and certain classifications and awards that folks can get for building in specific ways. And we looked at it and said, all right, there were certain things from each one of these categories that made sense. Mm -hmm. But we often found that everything from any category didn't make sense all the time. So we often found that it, in order for folks to get LEED certified or green certified or adding, obviously, Energy Star is, I wouldn't call it passe, but it, it, it's almost just a natural thing. It's well happened. established. Very much so. But we said, this doesn't make sense. Guys are paying money to get this certification when it's great, but they had to do 10 things that didn't make sense to get there. So we looked at it and said, home energy rating system, which is a blow door, it makes sure that your building is built tight. You've got a great envelope. It is circulating air properly. You're turning over that air enough times today throughout the day to allow for a good quality of airspace inside you are energy efficient across the board and you're using different areas in which to get those that hers score down below 55 and we are seeing that the appraisals are now starting to follow suit with what we think is the right way forward which is a designation on the uniformed appraisal report that says what does this house rate from an energy respect perspective mm -hmm. And that's thermal gain and loss and your tightness and how much energy you're using to heat that space and how long it's taking and how quickly you're doing and how much effective you are using what you've been given. And for us, it is solar. We're making sure things that are, if this person doesn't feel like he's going to do solar yet, making sure it gets pre-wired well and not that it's difficult to do after the fact, making sure that the geothermal is a requirement within all of that, that you may not have anything but geothermal right now. Okay. You were required to, to heat and cool your house using geothermal because you are taking you were you the delta between your ambient temperature and what you are running call we'll call it seventy two degrees is very nominal. You're having to go if you're trying to go from sixty two to seventy two, that's ten degrees. If you're trying to go from eighty two to seventy two, it's ten degrees. It doesn't cost much. There isn't a lot of energy required to create that. Whereas Traditional, you're having to take outside air temperatures that could be in the 30s, 20s, 15s and trying to get them up to 72. Obviously, the, the amount of energy that, that it takes to make that delta jump is different than ambient temperature to that. So we saw a very low, a very smart way to get that HERS score down immediately. And that was by forcing that to be something that you did here at Olivet. If you don't like it, if it isn't something that you think would make sense for yourself, there are lots of other places in the world you can live. Right. And yeah. We will not be the best fit for everybody. 
and we realize that. Um, but we sure are trying to do our best for the folks that do want to live here. How can people find out more about living at Olivet? Um, well, we can certainly find us on the web at www.olivetnc.com. And that's O-L-I-V-E-T-T-E-N-C.com. Um, we are giving tours to folks and practicing very careful social social distancing cleaning policies. We'd love to have you out. We have limited the amount of um, activities that we're doing as a community based on Governor Cooper's recommendations and now the new administration's recommendations. And um, you can reach us. We've got contact information and we would love to, to just share with anybody what we're doing, how we're doing it. Um, the other thing we're trying to accomplish is we are more of an open source type of development. And what we mean by that is I would love to pick the brain of folks that have gone before us and tell to learn, hey, what did you do well? What did you do poorly? What mistakes did you make? You wouldn't make again. And Mm -hmm. if we can offer what I will call sage advice, if that's what it is, maybe it's just, hey, don't be as dumb as we were on the front side. Scott Austin, co-founder of Olivet. Uh, I want to thank you for taking time with us to talk about the Olivet Riverside Community and Farm near Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, We hope to hear from you again. Well, we we really appreciate you guys doing this and putting this out there in the world and helping us share what we're doing. And anytime we can be on or we can be helpful, please let us know. We appreciate it. Well, folks, that was Scott Austin of the Olivet uh, Riverside Community and Farm. And uh, check it out at uh, www.olivetnc.com. We'll be back with another Innovator interview soon. This is Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear, and I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. Hey, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of the planet. We'll talk soon. (laughs) 